Great. So welcome, everyone. Uh, we're glad to go over a few different um, aspects of our COVID response today. And a couple of details, a reminder that uh, to use the Q&A to post your questions, we will have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Uh, we're using the live transcript feature in Zoom. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to get a cart writer today. Uh, so if you just turn on the subtitles for yourself under more, uh, the <clears throat> on my screen, it's the the three but three dots that you see uh, with the, the word more. You can get to either the live transcript or the subtitles uh, to be able to have that accessibility feature. And we will, as always, continue to work to get cart writers available live for these sessions as well. Um, so, uh, but send us your questions. We want to make sure we are responsive to what you need to know, uh, particularly with uh, the information that's forthcoming. As always, we have our, our team here to support you and um, really across uh, state agency lines and uh, with our uh, the support that we have from the Shaw Foundation as well. And so we're just all pleased to, to do what we can to, uh, to support you collectively and to make your work hopefully just you know, uh, better, more efficient for the students who you serve. Today, we're gonna talk about, uh, again, just starting with our COVID testing data. <clears throat> some additional information about the mask requirement in schools, uh, talking about the at-home tests over February break, which really includes sort of looking at uh, our testing schedule and uh, some update sort of embedded with that is, you know, a few updates on the testing program itself that we're pleased to bring to you today. And then, you know, kind of a transition into any other updates as well. So let's just jump in um, and always the, the data, uh, just to look at uh, how we're doing and, and what we're doing. Um, and so, like Jeremiah mentioned last week, uh, when he was able to look ahead and tell us that the uh, positivity rate uh, was coming down last week, which was great. Um, and so we see that reflected in the data as it was published last Thursday. Tomorrow is another publication day. And Jeremiah, anything that you want to say about this data set or anything that you see coming in the next data set? Yeah, thanks, Russell. And, and good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Um, just, I think, two quick things I would point to. Um, first, in the data that's going to be released tomorrow, which is from last week, the pool positivity rate is going to drop closer to about 3.2%, which is a pretty substantial drop. Um, the other thing that I just want to highlight is our average swabs per pool is essentially static from two weeks ago, which is this data, to last week, which is the data that's going to be released tomorrow. Um, and as I just want to highlight one more time, as that positivity rate drops, you can more safely include um, a larger number of sample, samples per pool. And I mentioned that um, because it will, it will have a tangible impact on turnaround time. So the more, the more pooled tubes the lab has to process, the longer it takes, the fewer people are in each tube, the more tubes there are. Um, so you can just help continue to speed that turnaround time um, safely as positivity rates fall by just including a couple more per pool back up to you know the five number, I think was the minimum um, that we had before the Omicron search. Thanks, Russell. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jeremiah. Appreciate that. So let's um, take a look at some of the updates on the mask requirement that came out today. I'm sure you're all aware of the announcement that the governor and Commissioner Riley and Commissioner Sutters made earlier today. Um, <clears throat> so just to review this uh, with you and, and add some uh, just additional details, um, we know that earlier today, the governor and Commissioner Riley announced that the mask requirement will be lifted effective February 28th and that any masking policies will at that point then revert to local control. <clears throat> Key reminder though, is that masks do continue to be required on all school buses per federal order. So transportation, like you know, when you go to the airport, when you get on the train, a bus, any bus, including school buses, uh, still have that requirement for masks. And so I think a, a really key thing uh, for everyone to, to kind of be thinking about is that the mask requirement is lifted, but masks are not going away 100% whatsoever. We're still going to see masks in schools in a variety of ways. Um, and really, you know, the, the next bullet, uh, I know Governor Baker feels really passionately about, um, and we do too, um, and we really want to just underscore this as much as we can, that we really want to support that, that individual choice of, you know, if your district decides uh, to not continue on, with a uh, masking policy after February 28th or whenever that day comes, we know there are individuals who are gonna continue to wear masks in schools. In fact, there are many who should and who will need to. And we just wanna make sure that there's just support for anyone who does that as a choice, um, that there are kind of no questions asked, obviously, and just creating that culture of respect around um, who's wearing a mask and uh, the decisions that might go into that. 
But let's look a little bit more about like when when those moments might come up that we would see masks in schools. You know, the print here is a little small, so I'll go slow and kind of uh, you know make sure that we're clear on this. Is that you know our our protocols document that you're familiar with that we just recently updated already has guidance in it about the use of masks, and that hasn't gone away. So we know, for example, that you know with the five day isolation and quarantine period, right? When an individual returns uh, after day five, right? Uh, that's allowable. So on day six, they do need to wear a mask around others for the remainder of that quarantine period. So for the full 10 days, right? So five days quarantine or isolation at home, another five days returning to school. Um, we know that individuals need to continue to wear the mask, uh, wear a mask during those additional five days. Um, and like we talked about in our last meeting, you know, except when eating, drinking, or outdoors. Um, along the same lines that, you know, if an individual is experiencing symptoms and they improve, right? They don't need, they don't have a fever. They're not continuing to require a fever reducing medication. They can return to school. So remember, this is uh, protocol C, uh, which is about symptomatic individuals. So if you have symptoms, get tested. Um, which is recommended, not required, but recommended to get tested if you have symptoms. Symptoms are improving. You don't have a fever. You return to school. Still want to see those individuals continue to wear a mask until their symptoms fully resolve. And then finally, and really importantly, you know, unvaccinated individuals should continue to wear masks in school settings. This is a recommendation. It's not a requirement, right? We're not saying that uh, anyone here is uh, absolutely required to do so but it's highly recommended. So strongly recommend is really the key word to hone in on there. Uh, before I go on, uh, let me just see, uh, Lauren, Dr. Madoff, Jeremiah, anything that you wanna add to this slide in particular? Nope, I think you got it, Russell. All right, another really important place where we know we're gonna continue to see masks in schools is in the health offices. Um, so, you know, we. And this just makes sense. Um, if you're going into a health office, you know, with the you know types of things that, that our nurses are dealing with, and particularly the symptomatic individuals, we're going to continue to see and have to have masks on in the nurses' offices, um, in our school health professionals' offices. And so um, this slide, you know, provides you with some more detail on that and the links to where to go to get information. And I, I just think it's maybe as you're thinking about this transition um, within your community about, you know, um, less masking um, is really kind of how you describe that, that it, there, we're not going to be at a point of no masking, right? Because buses, um, school health offices, you know, the types of, uh, you know, exceptions that I noted on the last slide, we're still going to see masks in our schools. And I, I don't want parents to get a false sense of, you know, well, my child should never have to wear a mask. Uh, in fact, if they're riding on the bus, they do. If they go into the, the nurse's office, they're going to need to wear a mask. The nurse is going to be wearing a mask. Um, we are going to continue to see masks. And so creating a culture of that, I think, is really important and protecting our and, you know, and, and supporting our staff members like our nurses uh, who will continue to wear masks, who will continue to need students to mask up or any visitors to their offices are going to need to mask up. And so, you know, um, getting that mindset now and communicating about that now long before February 28th, um, I think is really important. And um, so, you know, just thinking about that and, and, and working on it, I think will be important for your messaging. Um, we also know that uh, our, our staff who are gonna be coming in to continue to support the testing effort. So any of the staff subcontractors through CIC Health, uh, they will be wearing masks, right? So we're gonna, uh, another example of how we're gonna see masks in schools when they're taking sample, if they're doing specimen collection and taking samples, they're gonna be wearing masks. So um, again, Talking with your families maybe about less masking, but probably not no masking in our schools uh, because of these important exceptions, important places where masks are still uh, just, you know, really, really vital and really necessary. So, um, again, I'll just pause and see if I missed anything here uh, from my, my esteemed panelists. All right. We'll keep it going and um, we're glad to follow up also on any of these topics as well in other formats. Um, Please to see the audience that we have today, but we want to make sure this message gets out everywhere as well. So let's shift our attention to the use of at home tests over the February break, right? We know that for most of you, not everyone, because we have a lot of private schools involved in this initiative as well, but for most of you, you have February break coming up. We just want to make sure you're, we're really clear about what's going to happen um, with the distribution. Uh, that you'll be receiving next week and how it extends into the February vacation week. 
So we really want to, you know, again, think about safe in-person return, you know, safe return to in-person learning right after February break. So um, I, I want to make sure I have everyone's attention right now. If you are in our at-home testing program or not, right, we want to make sure that there are at-home tests available for all of you. For any interested um, organizations that want to have staff tests next week for all of your staff, we want to make that available for you in one way or another. Uh, so let's start with the, if you are in, this is a good time to think to yourself, which category am I in? As Russell is explaining this, right? Uh, if you are in the category of already participating in our at-home testing option, the next slide is for you, the next few slides, right? I'm going to get to the schools and districts that are not in our at-home testing program yet. If they're in our legacy program, they're, still, they're doing test and stay, contact tracing, or if um, you know you, uh, this is something that is of interest to you that you wanna know more about um, because you're not participating in our testing program at all, uh, you're in that second category. I will get to you in just a minute. So let's start with that first category. If you are participating in our at-home testing program, um, you already know this. I sent you a reminder earlier today. You just have to let us know how many tests you need for your students and staff, how many are participating, how many have opted in by close of business today. Today's the deadline. What you put in the ordering portal uh, through CIC Health is going to be what we ship to you next week. And so like the second bullet says here, we're going to ship to you uh, during the week of February 14th so that you are distributing a kit next week that has two tests in it, one to be used next week, one to be used during the February vacation week. So, um, you know, just getting ready for that, like once you distribute those kits next week, people are gonna be covered for the February vacation week. There's nothing else that you'll need to do, which is good news. Uh, we just wanna make sure that, you know, you've, you've got those, that or, those ordering numbers right. We um, really wanna make sure that if anybody needs that test next week before the break, they've opted in, they're, they've, they want it, let's make sure you've got the numbers for it. So we just ask that you think about, you know, if, if you think you might have some more opt-ins next week, you know, just consider adding some more to your ordering numbers. Not, you know, let's not, let's not go hog wild here, but, you know, keep it within reason of uh, what we expect to actually be around those opt-in numbers. Um, so particularly for our staff, we want to make sure that, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can for um, getting those staff numbers uh, strongly in place, uh, regardless of which type of school you're in. Um, and so uh, just making sure that you've, you've thought really critically about which what your ordering numbers are for next week. And again, um, if you've already put your numbers in for today or if your numbers haven't changed, um, there's nothing else you need to do. You do not need to take further action. Uh, there, we do notice some schools and districts in our program that have zeros for or no information entered and CIC is strategically reaching out to you. So. If you have nothing in our system, we're going to be con we have already we either have or will contact you today uh, to say, hey, are you sure? You know, do you need to put some numbers in for next week? Because we do not want there to be issues going into February vacation. So we're we're monitoring this really closely to make sure that no one is, you know, if there's nothing in our system, we're not going to ship anything. And we, we that's a that's a concern for us. So we're reaching out to you. We're making sure that we get that right uh, before we move along. Um, anything to add here, my other colleagues? I think that's exactly right, Russell. Thanks. All right. All right. Glad to see what questions our audience has as well as we uh, get to the end of today's pr presentation as well. But um, then let's go to that second category, right? So schools and districts not participating in the at-home component of our testing program. So um, if, like I said, if you are maintaining our legacy program, um, you're still doing, you know, you know, test and stay and contact tracing. That's your choice. And we have supported you with that. We have kept our support for you in place. And, and we want to make sure that you have a way of getting at-home tests for your staff during February break. So you haven't opted into the at-home testing program yet, but on a one-time basis, we want to make sure that you get a distribution of at-home tests next week. Here's what we're going to do. We are going to send out an email. It'll come from me to you, to those of you who this applies to. We're looking um, at, we know the number of, of entities that we'll be reaching out to, schools and districts that we'll be reaching out to uh, later on this afternoon. You need to turn it around pretty quickly though. There'll be a, there's a survey link in the letter uh, or in this message from me. And 
uh, we need you to turn it around by noon on February because we need to make sure that we're ready for you next week. Um, so later next week, and we'll give you more information about the location and the dates, but by responding to this survey, you are going to be telling us that you're kind of willing to send a vehicle uh, to you know a centralized location to be able to pick up the tests and bring them back uh, for your staff for your own internal distribution. And we know that you need this. You know, Friday is not an option for us to be giving you these tests, right? You have to have them. Like we know, kind of you know, Wednesday, Thursday next week are most likely the dates for pickup, um, and then that way you have you know Thursday, Friday. Uh, the rest of Thursday and all day Friday to kind of break them down, get them out to your schools and get them in the hands of your staff. Remember, this is for staff only uh, for your staff to be able to take home over February break. Um, so uh, we hope that that's helpful, um, that this is a, a resource that we want to make sure we're getting to you. Um, the test is our Celtrion test. So it's not eye health. It's a different test, but it's an at home test. It's easy to use. We've had other districts that have already used it um, on a more limited basis uh, throughout this winter. And so uh, we know that it's an effective antigen test that you'll be able to have access to if you're in this category. Um, if you don't, if you happen to not get this email from me today, though, and you're interested in this, uh, our fail safe is to make sure that you can just reach out to the K-12 COVID-19 testing email address that you see on your screen right now and just let us know, um, hey, I didn't get that email. Now, remember, we haven't sent it yet, so there's no need to email that email address yet. It's more like, you know, later on today, by close of business today, if you haven't gotten an email from me, that's when you should say, wait, I, I need to make sure I get that survey uh, so that I can get those staff tests, those at-home tests for our staff um, by taking the survey by noon, critical point, noon on Friday. We really will have a cutoff of noon on Friday because we've got to make sure that we start, you know, setting aside the supply that you'll need to be able to pick up. So again, I know I keep pausing, but I just want to make sure I don't ramble over anything here. Let me just see if there's anything that my colleagues want to point out. The slide says it, but I'm just going to say, and you said it too, but I'm just going to say it one more time. Everything that Russell just said is only applies to the schools that are not currently doing at-home testing. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> right. If you're doing our at-home testing program, you're covered. You're entering your numbers in the CIC health portal, you're good. But we are also just going out of our way to make sure we're supporting the districts that are not doing at-home testing yet. Lauren, what were you going to add, please? No, I was just going to say the same thing as Jeremiah. Great. All right. Thanks so much. Um, so we've had a lot. We've had some good questions that have come in about. All right. So you've got these at-home tests, right? Over a week off from school, when is the best time to take them? And you know, Dr. Madoff, I appreciated having a chance to talk to you about this earlier this week. I know I came into the conversation thinking about this from a school administration perspective of it would sure be nice to get those results maybe on Friday so that, you know, the principal could be preparing for any staff absences, you know, later in the week, like Friday, Saturday. Uh, appreciated, you know, you bringing the medical science to this and saying, actually, no, like if we're doing this from a public health perspective, we want to have the, the test done as close to the end of the vacation as possible to know what those results are going into the new week. Um, just because of the incubation period, you know, for the virus being fairly quick, you know, we want to know what what what's happening up to kind of that those those final hours, frankly, the the final day before we return uh, from the break. And so, um, really would appreciate if there's anything that that you could voice over here about, you know, the idea of of a Sunday um, and kind of within 24 hours of the return to school. Sure, Russell. Thanks for, for bringing that up. Right, the uh, the antigen tests uh, detect the presence of virus, and so the best time to do that is just before you're expecting to to be exposed to other people. So, these tests are adding an important layer of safety and and uh, precaution to returning to school, and so the best time to do that is just before return to school. In fact, I would add, if it's possible to do it, even a, an additional one a couple days after return to school is also would also be a good time to do it. But right before return to school is the best time to use up that test if you haven't had another occasion to use it prior. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, and so, you know, um, just building that into your communications with your staff uh, is so important as they get these at-home tests, letting them know when the expectation is to take them and so our recommendation, our best practice to share with you is to have that be within that 24 hours of return to school. 
Um, and then just making sure there's a notification, like what's the expectation for notification? What's the process for notification uh, if staff tests positive? So I think that's just really important to hone in on and I uh, really appreciate you know, Dr. Madoffy bringing the kind of public health science to this. Um, and you know, just really want to underscore that bullet that's in bold there though of there's, there's no uh, requirement to test in order to return to school. Um, it is optional, but you know, I think we had a good uptake in uh, when we did this in December, at the end of the December break, or in very early January. And so let's just bring that same attitude of you know a culture of of community of commitment to each other by just taking this this quick swab and seeing you know where we're at at the end of the break. Um, so let's uh, we'll move on to other topics um, right now uh, related to looking ahead to February break and just that delivery schedule one more time. Um, as we move ahead with today's presentation. So we, we've we talked about, you know, the, the districts that are participating in the at-home model right now, uh, that the deadline for ordering your kits is today. And so we know that it's both student and staff quantities that you're putting into the portal. You did this last week. Um, we want to make sure it's in again this week. The delivery, am I on the right? Yeah, I'm on the right date. Okay, great. Yep. Uh, so next week, those tests go out, right? and they will cut, you'll hand them out. It's one kit that covers your staff and students for two weeks. Um, so next week, um, you do not need to enter into the portal any more uh, quantity information because uh, we are not delivering during the week of February break. Notice though that during February break, we do need you to, if there are any updates to your quantities that by the 23rd you do need to update those quantities and so if you know what the quantities are going into the that weekend and you don't want to have to touch it again you can enter it as of the 18th right you can enter it and be done um but during the february break for most of you right most of you have the february break uh we just need to make sure that your numbers are up to date because then we're going to ship again uh the week of the 28th and so uh we hope that makes sense i'm going to go over it again on the next slide uh just one more time but we're getting a lot of questions again about just people wanting to understand the delivery cycle. And this next week will be the first time that we actually have a week off from putting any numbers into the, to the ordering portal, uh, which will be kind of a, a change for us. Uh, we've, we've been doing this week by week by week. And uh, it's really great that we're kind of finally to a point where we're just on a now a two week cadence for everybody. This is what we planned for. This is what we wanted. Um, but we need to not let our guard down when it comes to the 23rd and just be ready uh, for that ordering there. So again, we just kind of have the same information on this slide. It's useful for you or your team to just have this information to go back over internally. Uh, but you know, next week, participating schools and districts are going to get tests for their students and their staff. They're going to be distributed during the week of the 14th. And again, you'll know, take one test next week and then another test the following week. One test, yeah. sorry, Russell, just to interrupt you. The, the tests that be distributed next week, they're going to take be directed take one test during the week of the February break, week of February 21st, and then the second test during the week of the 28th. Great, thank you, Lauren. That's right, because we are a little bit ahead in our cycle. That's right, Correct. yes, yep. yes, uh, thank you. Uh, and so, and then like we mentioned before, uh, just making sure that your numbers are inputted by the 23rd so that we can move ahead from there. And um, we're, we are planning to, for our future, webinars and discussions with you have calendars for March and April so that we can just look ahead um, to see what's coming for March and April. And I know the private schools that have a vacation week or weeks in March, uh, we will then use that to kind of plot, plot ahead for how we can make sure you have the supply that you need, um, just like we're planning for the February break as well. Um, so anything else there? No, but this, um... Yeah, yes, um, it just starts our, our two week cadence <clears throat> and so our bi weekly cadence um, from here on out. And we will provide an updated calendar for March and April to give um, people an idea of when we will require them to input their students or update their student and staff numbers um, to go along with the two week cycle. All right, thanks so much. And uh, just that reminder again um, that we need your staff and student numbers updated by today. Again, if nothing's changed, you don't need to update them. Uh, whatever number is in our system as of each ordering deadline that's on that calendar, that's the number we're going to ship to you. And then if they have increased or decreased, uh, just update by the deadline. If you have, if you're sitting on a supply, right, and you can decrease by a bit, 
uh, then please do so so that you, you know, you're not sort of, you know, running into storage issues if you happen to be sitting on more than you expected to be for any reason. Um, the, I know that the storm, for example, kind of threw off some of the distribution at the end of last week, just as an example. All right, a uh, couple other important points to review with you. Um, just, I'm not gonna go over this slide, but that reminder of where to go to update your participation numbers in the CIC uh, health portal, um, the CIC health supply form. Sometimes I say portal on this slide, we label it as form. It's all the same thing. It's that one place where you go to update your numbers. Um, just easy information here to follow. I think you're pretty used to it. So, but in case you need it, uh, here's where you can um, go to get the information that you need. One final thing to talk to you about as we kind of look ahead to the test that you're receiving, um, both uh, you know anything that's coming in this week and in future weeks. Um, it turns out that that iHealth actually has sort of uh, the same test comes with slightly different packaging, and there's one packaging where um, the reagent is mixed into a tube. There's another uh, iHealth packaging where the reagent and the tube are separate, and you have to uh, drop the reagent into the tube in order to conduct the test. Um, it's pretty uh, explanatory. When you open the box, there are directions that have the, um, the pictures to follow. Um, but we want to make sure that there's no confusion about this difference between what we're calling test one, where the reagent is mixed in the tube, and test two, where it's not, and the individual has to add the reagent to the tube. So we want to make sure there are just clear directions for families on this. Um, appreciate uh, Rob Ford in uh, Lincoln who brought this to our attention. Um, and so always the feedback that we're getting from you just helps us make our program stronger. And so what we've done is uh, we've just made sure that uh, we have uh, directions available for you for uh, test set one, test set two, and the links to where you can find that information. Um, the directions that we have on our website are for the first test. So where you uh, the reagent is already mixed in the tube um, or added to the tube. Um, and, you know on a week by week basis, your families could be getting either test one or test two. And so we think it's important that you just add um, the, the instructional materials um, about that step of adding the reagent to the tube. Um, we have those instructions available for you. So uh, you might need to add that, um, an additional layer of instruction, additional you know, piece of the instructions on top of the existing instructions. So we have this, um, this additional piece about you know, how to add the reagent to the tube if necessary as a set of instruction for families. Um, we know how important translations are. This just recently came to, to light for us. And so we're getting those translations ready as soon as we possibly can. Um, but uh, any of the information and the translations will be available at the link that you see there. Um, Lauren, Jeremiah, anything else you want to add about this? No, just um, so in the bullet point where it says see full set of instructions here and it links to the FDA, we are working on getting that translated so that districts and schools will have one resource that accounts for the difference in test one and test two. We just didn't have that available yet and it takes us a little bit of time to get that full um, graphic translated. Um, and so we hope to be able to have that in the next couple of weeks, but for now, we're asking districts to be flexible and just use um, two sets of instructions, which is will all be posted on our website. Yeah, and I think you know families can get the hang of this. Um, we just probably need to explain it to them that you might get one where the reagent is in the tube. One you might have to add it. Either way, it works fine. Um, but you know it it might help with some communication from from you to your districts about this, or for you from you to your parents uh, about this as well. Great. All right, and we can certainly answer any questions that you might have about that. Um, so finally, just a, a couple other just updates about our, our testing program. And a, a lot of this is just a reminder of what we talked about last week, that you know uh, we want to make sure that the idea of the at-home test is, in general, yes, surveillance, you know, choosing a day of the week uh, when it's appropriate, when you want families and staff members to be taking the tests. Um, but they also can be used for symptomatic individuals. And so we just want to drive that message home again that you know each kit has two tests, and um, as you're explaining that distribution cycle, also just explaining that if a parent, for example, is noting symptoms in their child, they can go off of the cycle. They can use the test uh, for that symptomatic individual. We think that's a great use of the test. Um, there won't be another test that we can provide, 
but uh, you know, let's let's make sure that we just know what's happening with anyone who's experiencing symptoms. And then, you know, I think there are some great ways that we can, you know, kind of combine the symptomatic testing that's being done at home with symptomatic testing then that might occur at home, uh, where um, you know, the the person again who's symptomatic at home, the parent administers the test. Um, it's negative. Uh, but, you know, like we talked about before, the individual still could be experiencing symptoms. They return to school because they don't have a fever and they're not using fever reducing medication. Their symptoms are improving um, there, but they still have some symptoms. Uh, they could then still qualify for a symptomatic testing. And Dr. Madoff, we've talked about, you know, how you just mentioned before about kind of how helpful it is to sometimes have two tests. And I think we really have an opportunity to do that. Uh, Dr. Madoff, I don't know if there's anything more that you want to add about kind of how we can use these at-home tests and the in-school mm -hmm. symptomatic tests kind of in concert with each other to uh, kind of maximize safety. I, I just would say that these tests are very good, that they are very good at picking up symptomatic disease. Um, in just like we have for our guidance for the general public, um, if the first test is negative and a person has symptoms, it's a good idea to repeat the test 24 to 48 hours later. And that is just for picking up people who might be in the very early stages of an illness, might not have enough virus to make the test turn positive. So this is a good practice and um, it's, it's worth doing. And there hopefully will be plenty of tests available either at home uh, through other channels or at the school to get this done. So that, that's, that's, that's our thought. Yeah, thanks so much. And really the same thing could happen in reverse where the symptomatic individual tests in school first and then, you know, the school health professional uh, or, you know, educator or administrator, whoever is communicating with a parent, just reminding them of being able to use the at-home test then, you know, a couple of days later uh, just or a day later, like you're saying, in order to follow up um, if they tested negative the first time. So I think just thinking about how we can combine these resources uh, for coverage um, is important. And then, like you said, Dr. Madoff, where there are other resources um, through uh, pharmacies and you know the tests that the Biden administration is sending, there are other ways that we can make sure that we add to this coverage as well. Um, so thank you. Um, finally, uh, just that always that reminder of where to go to get our information and um, then uh, where to go to get help as well. Um, but I won't sort of uh, delay on those, uh, I won't delay questions to go over these slides. Um, we look forward to just hearing what your questions are and knowing how we can support you more. So I'll stop sharing and uh, see what, what kind of questions we have in the Q&A. Great, and Jeremiah, um, please jump in because I know that you were looking at questions. We did answer a lot of them and we have far fewer questions today than we have in the past, which is great. Um, but there are some questions about the school health offices and wondering, um, all individuals who enter the school health offices need to maintain masks or just the um, school health professionals that are operating the offices? Or is it for anybody who enters? Yeah, the, the guidance is, um, sorry, Dr. Meadow, go ahead. Uh, I could take that question or Russell, Please. you're certainly welcome to, but the, a school health office is, is a healthcare setting, just like a hospital or your doctor's office or a clinic. And uh, so, so the same, rules apply for, for PPE. And just as if, you, as if you go into a doctor's office or a hospital, you would put on a mask, you would do that going into a school health office as well. And of course, the professionals, the nurses and professional staff that work in health offices would also um, wear appropriate PPE. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's why it's so important that we talk about less masking in schools as opposed to no masking and help parents understand where there will still be masks on um, and just getting you know students and staff and everyone kind of used to this that um, it's there's a probably a combination approach to when we're wearing masks and when we're not uh, depending on if we're on a bus or the nurse's office um, in particular. There were some questions, Russell, to that point around um, how schools should ensure that students maintain masks um, if they're coming back from a quarantine or isolation and. Um, if students don't wear the masks um, from that time period, should they be excluded from school? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so keep in mind that we are not making this a, a, a mandate. It's strongly recommended, but it's not a mandate. And so as was the case when, you know, I, I think maybe it's applying some of the same logic that we used 
when we first started putting on the masks, well, when students, you know, returned to in-person learning back, if you can remember that time, back in the fall of 2020. Um, and, you know, there were concerns about that. I think it really comes back to kind of working with families and educating families about, again, this idea that there's less masking, but there are times when there's going to continue to be masking. And, um, you know, particularly that return from quarantine being um, one of those key moments where um, we can't, we as a state, DESE isn't requiring it, uh, but we do want families to comply and to embrace this idea that there are some times when you need to continue to wear a mask. And <clears throat> I know you worked with your families when uh, back in the fall of 2020, <coughs> Winter of 2020, um, there were you know individuals who questioned it, and you worked with them to get them there. And I would encourage you to do the same in this case. I would just add, it is a really important part of the isolation and quarantine part um, protocols. The masking for the five days after the isolation or quarantine period has ended. You know, it's important. We want kids to get back to school. We want staff to be back in school, and when when they when they're out of their isolation or quarantine period, but um, it's it's equally important that they not uh, transmit disease and wearing a mask is a very important part of that. I, I just wanted to say also that um, and 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 you may have touched on this a little that it's important that that we not stigmatize people for wearing masks. That it's it's really important that we create an environment where um, whether or not there's an overall mask mandate that that um, people who who do wear masks for personal protection um, or, or whatever reason, um, be encouraged, allowed, uh, that they be allowed to do so without discomfort. And I think that's really important. Yeah, we're so preparing now and, and talking about it now, of what the future is gonna look like. It's again, a future with less masks, not no masks. Great, Jeremiah, oh, were you gonna say something? I was, I have, maybe it's the same question, maybe it's not. Um, there have been a couple of folks in the Q&A who have asked about, um, Smith asked, even though additional tests are not available if a student uses their surveillance test for symptomatic testing, if you have a small surplus, can you send another box home? Um, so we're constantly rounding up to the nearest box of 90, sorry, the nearest carton of 90 boxes of tests for you all. And I think that that reflects a general desire on all of our parts to to put more tests in your hands, not less. And this is the kind of thing where if you do need to send another box home and you have another box, um, we are not gonna be policing that, I think, very strictly. Um, Dr. Matter of fact, you all the time uh, when I say more testing is better. Jeremiah, I'm gonna stick on you because there is a question about, um, can you explain, can you tell us more about inconclusive results? On the rapid tests, I assume I didn't see this one. I'm sure it's in there. but yeah, I, guess so I think that that's actually I think that those are very related. Um, so if somebody just got their box on Tuesday, they take their first test on Thursday. They had an inconclusive result. Take another one, right? You can do it that night. I don't know, Doctor Matt, if you prefer that they do it immediately, or if you maybe wait 24 hours or something like that. Um, if, if for an inconclusive result, are you saying that? Yeah, and, yeah. Sorry, I didn't see the question, but yes, that's what I think. Yeah. yeah, there there shouldn't be too many inconclusive results. If you see a line on these tests, yeah. it's positive, right? And if you don't see a line, it's negative. Um, the situation where it's worth retesting, I think, is if someone has symptoms, you you have a high level of suspicion for COVID, um, and the initial test is negative, it's worth repeating. If you see a little line there, even a faint line, that is a positive test and you should treat it accordingly. Yeah. Thank you. Lauren, I'm just Thank noting you. that um, there are some questions coming up about uh, some of the content that we covered at the very beginning about the um, requirements for wearing masks, like the vaccinated versus unvaccinated. So I'll just put that slide back up so that people can see it if they came late to the presentation today. That's great. I was just gonna have you repeat that. And then Russell, um, I um, wasn't privy to the announcements made um, by EEC, but do you, do you have any information about what was announced from EEC today in regards to masking? Um, people are questioning about their pre-K programs and um, any OSP um, programs. Uh, it's a great question and I hate to say it, but I was so kind of caught up in, um, in our announcement that I didn't pay close attention to feel like I'm kind of ready to uh, to quote that. Jeremiah, right. do you 
Do you know where Dr. Dr. Madoff? I don't believe that there is a statewide uh, mask mandate in place for EEC right now. Um, OT, outside of school time, I don't know well enough to come in on. Okay, we will get back to people on that. I Great. believe masks are still required in EEC settings. This does not the, the this uh, does not address EEC. I'll go Tim. Yep, we'll follow up. Yep, we will follow up. Great, Russell. I think we've answered uh, many of the questions um, as best we can um, or as best we could during this webinar. And so, you know, don't want to hold people unnecessarily. Yep. Great. Great. Um, and, you know, I did just uh, receive notification that <clears throat> um, EEC is, is aligning with DESE. Uh, so um, well, we have alignment there. And uh, again, we can just make sure that's really clear. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here and thanks for your great work. And we look forward to seeing you um, perhaps next week. We'll see how it goes. Uh, we're going to be kind of busy with the uh, test distribution as well, um, our team here. So uh, we will, if we don't see you next week, we'll see you after the February break. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Take good care.